Greetings, travelers. Due to popular demand, I have finally come back to explain the story of Final Fantasy XIV. The patches are officially wrapped up, so I guess I'm going all in this time. As we are all aware, the next expansion is both the end of the current story and apparently like 20 hours of cutscenes longer. This will also probably be a stupidly long video, far beyond the scope of anything I've made on this channel thus far. I could split it up into multiple videos, but I'll just put some chapters in for the massive heaps of plot that I'm trudging through. Something something, support the channel. I'm not wasting any more time, let's get into it. We begin with the end of Stormblood, but not really. If you remember my last video on this topic, the gang repelled the Empire from two areas and killed Xenos, whose body is missing and being piloted by an Ashian. Amazing. Thancred has decided to spy on Garlemald to confirm this suspicion. After freeing those prisoners and feeling pretty good about it, Alphino decides to go to Garlemald as well, but more legally than Thancred, being invited by this empirical guy who's almost sane. I'm sure that's going to go very well. Meanwhile, off-screen, the Empire is working with an Ashian-possessed Xenos, and this weird dude who is trying to fix an airship has his own cutscene, but he ends up killing a man and saying some very Xenos-like stuff. Now, if you haven't figured it out yet, yes, this dude is being possessed by the real Xenos. He is not actually dead for good. And to clarify, this is Xenos, this is not Xenos. Make sense? Yeah, I thought not. We get a notification to go back to the real Alamigo. Thankfully, you're interrupted by Thancred, who is completely wasted, disheveled from his journey back from the Empire to inform everyone that yes, not Xenos is an Ashian now. But after he hydrates, uh, drink water everybody, he says that he got a distress signal from Alphano, simply saying, The Burn. I'm not really sure why he used the phrase feel the burn as a distress signal. Oh, it's the name of a barren wasteland that's been depleted of its aether. Damn, and here I thought we were about to see Swolfano after an off-screen training arc. Not visible to the Warrior of Light, but visible to the viewer, Alphano is attacked in the burn by the Emperor's personal guard themselves, but was saved by a big, strong, hot man who doesn't give his real name, but carries around a gunblade and knows who the Scions are, and says he played a part in the history of the Scions. So anyways, this totally unidentifiable guy says that he hunts Ashians, and he has the mask to prove it. He takes Alphano away to safety. Meanwhile, you try to find Alphano in the burn unsuccessfully, and probably wipe a few times to the final boss of this dungeon, because it's impossible content. No one has ever cleared it. Alize is understandably not very happy about all of this, but oh well. You then return to the Doman Enclave, which is near the burn, and this is kind of important. Lisa's in Doma for some reason, and everyone agrees that we need Doma to put more EVs into defense. Lisa reminds Hian that you need to go back to this stupid fucking table where I swear I'm always falling asleep at these meetings and these cutscenes. Seeing as Lisa can just go to Doma on a whim, this further confuses me about the distance between Doma and Alamigo. Sure, people can teleport, but come on. You think Lisa's gonna do that? Ishtola has a plan to defend Doma because he found some cool ruins that you can generate a barrier to defend the Domans from a potential empire attack and it just needs a power source. Yes, I'm not even joking about any of that. They literally just found some bullshit technology in the burn and immediately knew what to do with it. Yeah, yeah, it does look similar to Azislaw, which also made a barrier, but it's a little convenient, don't you think? Thankfully, the Asm Step has some really cool stuff that you can use to power said barrier. The only way to convince the locals, who technically have to listen to you in the first place because you won that tournament arc. Does anyone remember any of that? A anyways, you have to beat Sadu to death multiple times. This is because the tribe she is from are the ones that actually worship the power crystals and you want to earn their respect. How many Phoenix Downs are you gonna down? I could do this all day! So you win, and Ishtola does some cool magic, and we all win. Except this dude proposes to Ishtola, and she puts that loser in his place. And nothing of value was lost on that day. This finishes the Asm Step story where things happen... maybe. Back at that table where we talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, I see, we have an idea. We can maybe make the Empire more unstable if we spread a rumor that Xenos is actually possessed, which Lys rightfully points out no one would believe given that Ashians are not exactly common knowledge. 
Thancred counters this by saying anyone within the Empire will use an excuse to try and claim the throne, and rumors of Xenos' death have already spread, making a story about him being a puppet believable? Yeah, I'm not really sure. This plan sounds kind of stupid. At least Doma is part of the Alliance now. Before you can develop this horrible plan any further, you hear a voice in your head and lose sight of everything. This happens to all the Scions at the table, and this voice is asking you to do something vague, and after you gain control, Thancred passes out completely and has to be rushed away to a hospital. This has put everyone on edge because no one knows what that voice was or who is responsible. Hopefully, they aren't a bad guy. Connie Senna reveals that you are likely having your souls called upon from another reality, and that Thancred's soul has left his body and is probably in the place that he was called from. This is because he's more sensitive to these things since he was previously possessed. In other words, his body is here, but his mind is somewhere else. So you go back to more donuts and talk to Udi Anger about this incident. Udi Anger says that, yeah, it's pretty weird. Ishtola also briefly mentions that the ether is thinning in areas in the east, and Udi Anger says, oh shit, you too? I only bring this up because it's actually foreshadowing for like 50 hours of gameplay from now. Time to ignore that for a bit because the voice calls out again, and Ishtola and Udi Anger have also been inflicted with the horrible illness of Down for the Count. I guess there's a cutscene in the middle of this battle. Well, I'm not really sure what's happening, but let's try to move on while these three scions are taken care of. Okay, here's the Empire off screen. Not Xenos is pressuring the Empire to destroy Alomigo again. Varus is hesitant, weirdly. After Not Xenos leaves, another dude shows up. It's the founder of the Empire. Yes, the literal founder. The grandfather of Varus. Well, he's an Ashian without a revealed name yet, and he's here to tell you that Not Xenos is actually Elidibus, and the Empire was founded by the Ashians to sow chaos. As cool as the Empire is, it's not as great as the Empire of Alig that the Ashians also created. Varus shoots this Ashian because he's a bit annoying, and he respawns saying that it sucks to be you, Varus, being a puppet. Now go and create a calamity now because that's why I hired you. And that's what the Empire is planning, to cause another calamity. How are they going to do this? Thankfully, we get to see Alphanos' perspective again while traveling with a guy who we still have no idea who he is, and they find an outpost of soldiers completely lifeless as if they just dropped dead where they were. No signs of fighting. It is revealed that the Empire developed a piece of chemical weaponry, which is what they are definitely planning to use to cause a calamity. Back to the Rising Stonemasons, Kryl is here to tell you the exact same thing Thancred, Udianger, and Ishtola have all had their souls ripped from their body. However, she suggests that you can find their souls if we encounter Matoya again. Man, it's back to one of the best characters. Matoya says, oh look, it's not Alphano. You seem rather upset. Alize says, no shit, Sherlock. And Matoya says, good. Be angry, because it's better than being sad. Kryle uses Matoya's crystal ball to follow the souls of the not-dead Scions, and their threads just end in the middle of nowhere. Before she can elaborate, though, you receive an important message. The team that Alphano left with to go to Garlemald has been found in Alamigo. Maxima, from Team Magma, here, tells you that Alphano is alive, and as far as he knows, that he left with a mysterious Ashing Hunter, and that's why he isn't with them currently. Alize is relieved to hear that Alphano is probably alive, but then you both suffer another headache hearing a voice. Lise doesn't though, which is important because I will use this to dunk on her later. Boom. What's that? It's a Garlean ship crashing into a barrier that we just made a little while ago. Oh shit, Alphano is not dead, just unconscious like everyone else. Who is this man and for whom does he fight? It's Gaius. I'm making a Praetorium joke. Please clap. So yes, Gaius wants to kill Ashians, which sounds pretty good to me. Although you have to kill Ashians with Aether Blasts and freaky crystal things, so I guess Gaius is just annoying the crap out of the Ashians, which I consider a positive regardless. He says that the Scions and him are aligned as we all hate Ashians. The ones with the red masks are the big boys of the group, and so far you've killed Lahabrea and know of a little bit, but Emmet Selk is a name that you're not aware of. Thankfully, he and Alphano destroyed the chemical warfare facility off-screen, so that problem has been stalled for a bit, but it was clear that not Xenos was ready to unleash it. Gaius is also kind enough to say that we should focus on killing the Ashians, even though he still wants to help his homeland, emphasizing the horrors of the Empire are not the result of the people, but of those in power. The Scions reach an agreement, and you receive one unconscious Alphano on the side of your plot exposition. They also found a ton of clones of the Empire's founder, but don't worry about that. Welcome to another Empire cutscene. They're rebuilding the gas-making facility, meaning that Gaius's efforts are temporary, but calamities are forever. 
The Empire founder not leaving a successor was all part of his plan, although he doesn't elaborate on what exactly that plan was. I do really like these cutscenes with the Ashian and Varus, as you can see how uncomfortable Varus is when chatting with them. So Ashian Man, who may or may not be Emmett Selk, says that he has business to take care of and have fun with that gas thing. With word of the Empire planning to storm Alamigo again, everyone is planning defense. Anyways, let's actually talk to the Empire. Varus is going to be there, and oh boy, do I hate talking. Alright, it pretty much boils down to this. People who are under Garlean rule says that it was fucking awful. Varus says it wouldn't have sucked so much if he just stayed conquered, losers. Amaric says that endless war only ends in doom for everyone. Ishgard would know that best. Varus counters with, well, you might have made peace with the dragons, but it was only after you killed Nidhogg, though. So really, you were just the better player in this game of war. Yeah, nobody is really happy, although Varus says he's not opposed to peace somehow. And well, we all try to take a break and find some common ground, and the most important question is finally asked. Why do you want to conquer everyone so badly? Varus then explains it's simple. To rule over everyone, cause six more calamities to rejoin all the shards of the world and become whole again, and then defeat the Ashians. So please, let us conquer you. Everyone then explains that we don't need to rejoin the shards and that people might be flawed, but it's by working together and overcoming weaknesses that we can succeed. So in other words, I can kick the Ashians ass right now and I don't need any of your shit, Varus. So everyone leaves the table, affirming that the next time that we meet, it'll be on the battlefield. Time to get ready to rip and tear. Insert cutscene of us preparing for battle. Alize reminds us that we are the only scions left at this point, so we better both survive this battle for everyone's sake. Easy battle is easy, everything trembles before your awesome might, even the loser Power Rangers, although you still aren't capable of beating a giant piece of Magitek without an NPC using Limit Break 3. While your victory over the invasion wasn't too bad, it doesn't stop Alize from collapsing with the same condition that has claimed the rest of the Scions up until this point. Also, double bad news, despite the Empire retreating, not Xenos is here to kick some ass. He and in company attempt to hold the line, but it doesn't exactly work out. The Warrior of Light might be getting repeated migraines, but that isn't stopping you from going to the front lines yourself. Time to do one last final instance of the same Xenos fight for Stormblood. Please, I am so fucking sick of doing this over and over again. If we have to do this one time in Endwalker, it's already too fucking many. Despite your victory over not Xenos, he gets up, and then you faint like all the other Scions. Man, whoever is calling us has some fucking terrible timing. Alright asshole, I'm fucking ready to tussle now. No one stops me from my spree of defeating not Xenos. Yeah, there's no cause for alarm you blue looking ass douchebag. I was about to beat Final Fantasy XIV, it hasn't even been done before. Okay, so we wake up in Ishgard, and apparently we were not mortally wounded, unlike what you might think based on the cutscenes. Astinian managed to heroically save you in a cutscene that doesn't exist, and not Xenos had to retreat because he was not in good shape after that thorough ass whooping. After recovering, you go back to the rising sediments, and everyone is happy to see that you are alive, especially Tataru, who tells you not to fight not Xenos alone. Don't tell me what to do. Anyways, your friends are probably in another reality with the dude that called out to you, so let's go bring them back while the battle is currently at a stalemate. Why did the Empire retreat? Because rumors of not Zenos being possessed actually worked, and the Emperor is afraid of another power struggle from within. Also, Varys looks at the camera and says, Make the poison gas. Roll credits for the actual end of Stormblood. Real Xenos gets another body that still isn't his, and we're left to look towards the Crystal Tower like the man in our visions told us to do. Welcome to the actual start of Shadowbringers. Go to the Crystal Tower, find a symbol of the Ironworks, and that is how you teleport to where your friends are. Alright, welcome to the first, a place that will need some introductions. First, let's look at this travel animation. Ooh, very cool, very interesting. Look at all that plot flying right by us. Oh shit, is that a vision of Minfilia stopping a wave of piss and saying that it's not the time? Hey, it's the Warrior of Darkness walking around. And there we are, awake in a very strange bright land. Okay, maybe this guy can help us. It's nighttime, he says. Man, this is the brightest it's ever been. Yep, night doesn't happen around here anymore, he says. It's been about a hundred years since there was last a dark sky. Is that another bottle of alcohol that I can't accept? You son of a bitch, Yoshida. Let me accept some wine for once. Alright, if you go to the Crystal Tower, that's where the nearest city is. Title drop. Hey, 
You're not familiar. Where are you from? A place that you've never heard of? Oh shit, is that a monster that just ate the dude that you met four seconds ago? Damn, at least the dude from our visions is here to bail us out. This is the Crystal Exarch, by the way. So this world, which is called the First, was almost completely consumed by light. More than 90% of it, actually. And now monsters called Sin Eaters roam the land and prey on those that remain. This is all important exposition. So you go to the city and learn about how it functions, which is not important to the plot. What is important though is that time works differently between the first and the source. Don't worry about time dilation too much, but it does mean that your friends were teleported here over the time of days in the source, but they've actually been here for years. Thancred has been here for 5 years, Ishtola and Udianger 3, and Alphino and Alize about 1. So no, she still isn't legal. Also, the Crystal Tower being here in the first is surprising, although asking about Grahatia from the Crystal Tower story makes the Exarch say he doesn't know who that is. This is when I tell you that the Crystal Tower raid story is mandatory for the plot now. But I will not be covering it other than Grahatia is effectively the caretaker of the Crystal Tower in the source. Mr. Exarch dude here didn't want to summon your friends, but it's what happened when he tried to summon you. He accidentally summoned those closely tied to your fate. In other words, lease is irrelevant. Also, you are here in your entirety, but since the Scions are only souls, they can't return to the source unlike you. He is working on a way to send them back, but it's not happening anytime soon. And you're pretty much caught up on everything about being in the first. You get a tour of the city and it's very interesting. So much so that I won't talk about it. I mean, they literally say that money can be exchanged for goods and services. Thankfully, your gill and their currency are about the same, and nobody cares that they are different. Yes, there is a lore reason for why you can buy things in the first. The other important thing is that this fairy, Fail U, forms a pact with you, so that you can travel between the rifts as well as do things like access retainers and send messages back to the source. Once again, it's just a lore explanation for doing basic gameplay stuff. But you can send a message back to a specific Lollafell of your choice. Fail Ul also calls you a sapling and themselves a branch, which is probably going to awaken some weird fetish in me. At least they called my Warrior of Light adorable. Here's your hotel room where things will happen many times. Nice view though. Oh look, it's the Warrior of Darkness. He is a ghost now. In case you didn't know, this is the hero of old from the first who was tricked into causing the flood of light that was stopped by Minphilia, becoming an eternal servant of Hydaelyn and the rest of his crew sacrificing themselves. While he's just been a ghost roaming the land, he is not sure why he was forced to stay behind while his comrades were sacrificed. His name is Ardbert and we will get very well acquainted with him throughout this tale. For now, only you can see and hear him, and he says that he will watch what you do now that you're trying to save the first, which he believes is beyond saving. Back with the Exarch, he tells you that your fellow Scions are scattered in different regions, but the most accessible are Alphino and Alize. Thancred is traveling with a new companion, and they could be literally anywhere. So you can find either twin first, let's start with everyone's favorite cutie, Alphino. You get to fly to Kalushia, an island home to the bourgeoisie. We do some things to try and get some booze from a bar, fucking finally. Alphino shows up and we talk about how cool we are. To understand Kalushia, there is Yulmore, home of the rich, and everyone else lives in either small settlements around, which are dangerous thanks to being constantly at the whim of monster attacks, or a Hooverville at the bottom of Yulmore, where people try to gain access to the city. You can go to Yulmore if you have a shitload of money, or are proven to have a skill worthy of one of the Aristocats. Despite promises of a bright future by going to Yulmore, of those who go there, no one returns. They also hand out food in this impoverished town called Mule every time they recruit someone to the city. This food is plot relevant. Alphino has a plan to get into the city to gain some insight, but his idea is stolen by this cat boy named Kaishir. Kaishir reveals that all of his friends and family gained access to the city, but not him. And in his starvation and desperation, he stole Alphino's plan as a last ditch effort. Alphino realizes the severity of the situation and says Kaishir can use his idea to gain access to the city. Meanwhile, a body washes up on the coastline nearby. The man on the beach who doesn't have a cutscene was a painter who was thrown off the top of the city into the ocean for not being good enough. Alphino does know how to paint though and figures he can gain access to the city now by taking this vacant opening and claims you to be his assistant. You take a shower and slap on some nasty perfume and meet your clients, the Chais. Dulia Chai says that Alphino is cute as fuck. 
and you walk around and investigate the city. The life of servitude is certainly as awful as you would expect it to be, although it does seem to entirely depend on who you serve. I guess you could always be a stripper in this part of town. This girl who sings has lost her voice for good, but her patron doesn't want her to leave and die, and mentions something about ascension, which sounds great, but also very ominous. While Chai Nuz doesn't like Alphino for painting him and his waifu realistically, also Kaishir is found out to be a fraud and is forced to commit seppuku by the very interesting looking ruler of Yulmore. This guy can also command Sin Eaters and wanted to feed them some aether from Kaishir. Alphino tells Valthry that he's a loser and we will never be welcomed back into Yulmore with open arms. At least Dulia Chai isn't happy about it and Kaishir leaves with us. Don't worry about this hissy fit or the very obvious Ashian in the background. Alright, it's time to go find the cooler Alize, now that we know how much of a paradise Yulmore isn't. So you go to Amarang, which is a desert with buildings. You do some stuff in More Soup, where they really like people spending money. At least they accept anyone as a citizen as long as they're willing to help the merchants. So the Exarch gave you a small fortune to spend, which attracts everyone's attention as you decide to buy some food that would probably only be appealing to Hachima. The Warrior of Light celebrates by projectile vomiting all over the market. You then travel to the inn at Journey's Head, where Alize has been helping. Tesseline is a caretaker here of the victims of Sin Eater attacks, where their ether has been imbalanced, and they will eventually turn into Sin Eaters themselves, and they just spend their final days here. They kill them off before they transform into Sin Eaters by mixing poison with their favorite food. And yes, all Sin Eaters were normal living creatures before they were corrupted by light. Holy shit, uh, this is kind of brutal. Also, here is a lore moment explaining the legends of the Warrior of Darkness who would kill everybody regardless of who they are. Sounds pleasant. Harlick, a patient, goes missing and Tesseline chases after him and we get to see said transformation happen in real time. This graphic cutscene is also similar in length to Tesseline's character development, although Alize has known her for a year. Well, after that tragedy, I guess it's time to go back to the Crystarium. These first set of quests for Alphino and Alize really help the setting and give you an idea of what the stakes are in the first. The Exarch explains that while each shard exists, they are at least somewhat connected. By overflowing the aether of a shard, it essentially flows into the other shards, but especially into the source. And currently, the first is very close to having enough light to overflow. Certain Sin Eaters have an abundance of light, and they are known as Light Wardens, and by slaying them and removing their light, it will be enough to restore balance and prevent the first from collapsing. Obviously, destroying Sin Eaters will not sit well with Valthry, the leader of Yulmor, since his command over them is integral to his position of power. But our goal is to hunt the Wardens anyways. Uh-oh, a town called Holminster Switch is under attack. Coincidentally, fending off the Sin Eaters allowed you to find the first Warden, and by slaying it, don't worry about killing Tosleen before this, causes the light from the Warden to flow into you. What is important here is that killing the Wardens was always possible, but the light within them would simply disperse and form a new Warden. Thanks to the blessing of light that you have, you can store the light instead of letting it disperse and restore darkness to Lakeland. Yes, very much literally making you the bringer of shadow. So you agree to help by hunting the remaining wardens. Alize wonders why the Exarch is so determined to save the first, and his only response is that there are things that he never wants to lose. So you go back to your inn where Ardbert appears and says, I guess you're the warrior of darkness now. Ironic. He also says that, man, being a hero means losing a lot around you. But remember, keep your friends close. Also, this Minfilia-looking character appears and says that she needs to find the person responsible for the darkness. So in the Crystarium, Yulmore sends their top military official named Ranjit to basically say, Since you probably caused the darkness, prepare for war. Also, I know that you're hiding the warrior responsible for this using magic in this room currently. So Yulmore is a problem now. Ranjit has been its military leader for a long time, since even before Valtteri, and used to lead the attack against the Sin Eaters. He also used to train up each and every generation of Minfilia. Wait, what? Yeah, the Exarch says, you probably want to go to the library and learn about the reincarnating Minfilias in the first. The short version, there's a bunch of Minfilia lookalike that are the oracles of light, and every time one dies, a new one is born, and they usually fight the Sin Eaters. Due to the nature of the oracle, they are very helpful for fighting the Sin Eaters, and since Yulmore no longer wants to fight, 
They want to capture the current Minfilia to make it harder for you to kill the Wardens. So you tell the people of the Crystarium it's time to fight Yulmore and restore darkness and your first order of business is saving Minfilia. The battle begins by sprinkling dust from the skies that puts soldiers to sleep. You get to fight Ranjeet, but it doesn't go super well. Oh hey, at least Thancred's here. And the Exarch helps you escape to the land of fairies, where the Yulmorian army will not chase you because nobody would dare go there. Oh yeah, just like how the Empire wouldn't go to the Asm Step, I'll believe that shit when I see it. A rock is a rock. Welcome to the land of fog and fairies, or pixies, or whatever you want to call them in the first. So Minfilia tells you that she left the bodyguard Thancred to try and find you because she felt the calling and gets scolded for being captured. Thankfully the pixies nearby say let's play and we are all already under some mischievous spell. Oh yeah, the pixies are fake creatures formed from the dead souls of children, which is why they want to play all the time until they kill people that they are playing with. Man, even the most lighthearted stuff in Shadowbringers has to have some fucked up description. It's like reading about a Pokemon and finding out it's some real dark stuff. So you use a piece of special grass to find the pixies hiding in plain sight. And they say if you do some chores for us, we'll lift this spell and we'll take you to see Urienje who's been living here. And thus, these chores are a complete waste of time and unending. Is this the writers going full meta about all the fetch quests? Nah, it must be my imagination. God, if only we knew a pixie who could get us out of this. Fail Ool, the coolest of the cool, the hottest of the hot. Please get us out of this, for God's sakes. Fail O shows up and tells all the other pixies to fuck off. This person is mine to bully. And the spell is broken. So we go see Uri Andrew, who gives you some lore drop about alchemy stuff that goes right over my head. Look, I leveled it to 80, but all I do is make tinctures. Basically, he said something about light maybe being closer to dark in the first, but he really could have just said, light seems kind of bad in the first TBH, and I would have taken it. Basically, he's teaming up with us again, and we need to work with the local living creatures to defeat the Light Warden, who is the king of the pixies. Although they use the term king, pixies don't really have genders, as far as I can tell. To get into the castle, you need to find four fashion accessories. One is with the pixies, another is with these other people that I don't understand, another is with the bird people, and another is with the frog thingies. Yeah, seems good enough to me. We get a vision of Thancred when Minfilia was actually Minfilia and not Minfilia. Makes sense. Basically, Minfilia has turned into an eternal entity similar to the Ashians and possesses bodies of others. But Minfilia doesn't actually want to take over the lives of others and wants these Minfilias to live the way that they want. Although Thancred wants to bring Minfilia back and you see what their history is like together. But Minfilia says she will only fully come back if this person who she is possessing wants it. Yeah, I really wish they didn't have the same name at this point in the plot. Anyways, do a chore in this dungeon to get one of the things that we need to get into the castle. So, uh, your party seems to forget that you were unable to drown, but I appreciate the sentiment. Also, Ardbert tells you that these creatures come from spirits of the drowned. So we do some chores for another group called the Namu, who love mortals, and Minfilia is having an identity crisis, wondering if she should live her life or give it to Minfilia. Yeah, that's some pretty heavy shit. Let's just go do some work for the bird people to get another thing that we need to storm the castle. Seto is the former pet of Ardbert, and he tells of how Ardbert is a kind and noble soul, who although was responsible for the flood, it wasn't his fault. Seto still believes in Ardbert, and your soul looks similar to his. You can see Ardbert overhear this and walk away emotionally. And Yulmor is here, because as we all know, they would never step foot into Ilmeg. Well, while they are distracted, it's time to go fight Titania, the King of the Fairies. And Light Warden. This trial. This fucking trial. If there is a single instance in the MSQ that destroys my faith in humanity, it's Titania. The amount of cursed runs I have had is too high for me. I'm not even talking about extreme. I have seen it all from the ads killing every single person one by one until the tank finally thought, hey, maybe that's not an intentional mechanic. I even had a group that couldn't clear the DPS check with everyone alive on normal. My experiences in this instance is where the origins of my mentor animosity are rooted in. If you're new to the game, no, this instance is not hard at all, but the player base will try to make it as hard as humanly possible. <sighs> After that victory and sucking up that light, Fail O becomes Titania, the new Pixie King, and the Yulmorians retreat. 
or get waterboarded. So Fail Ul says to call upon us any time you helped us so that we will help you. Just ask if you need help. I am emphasizing this a lot because Fail Ul literally says, Yes, we will help you with the Sin Eaters if you just ask us to. Well, before we can actually go back to that in room, the founder of the Garlean Empire shows up and says, Hey, I'm an Ashian. You ruined my attempt to rejoin the first with the source. I don't really like that, but you know what? I am curious to see what you do because La Habrea got fucking killed when he tried to stop you, and I'm not a big fan of dying. I swear, you can totally trust me. Okay then, introducing another ephemeral person to follow us around on this journey. Welcome, Emic Selk. Get in line. So you actually go to your in room and talk to Ardbert about your journeys as heroes in each of your realms as the camera fades to black. In the crystal meeting room, Emmett Selk tells you that he doesn't plan to interfere. If you succeed in your plan, he will consider you an ally and give you the horrible truth of the world. Well, he leaves and everyone agrees, Ashians are still bad news. We have to find the next Light Warden and the Crystal Exarch was invited to play Super Smash Bros. Ultimate with Valtry. So you're gonna go to the land of Lahi and meet up with Ishtola. The Emmett Man is here, by the way, just watching. He gets surrounded by the local tribe claiming that you are Sin Eaters. Emmett Selk says, see you later, and teleports away. Then Ishtolo appears and says, hello friends, and person who I don't know who is full of light. Wait a minute, that's me. She goes, oh shit, what? And everyone lowers their weapons. What is important to remember is that Ishtola sees with ether and not with eyesight. And because of all that light that you absorbed, that's why she thought you were a Sin Eater. So the people of Slitherboro here worship darkness itself, which makes about as much sense for a world full of light. Ishtola says there are also ruins of Ranka, an ancient civilization here, that are guarded by a group of bunny girls that will kill everyone on sight. The Light Warden is probably hiding somewhere in their land, and we need to figure out how to get there without getting stepped on by big hot bunnies. Thankfully the XR gave us a tablet with a clue before we left to get here. So you do some chores in town and eventually do a ritual where you get splashed with some dark infused water and it slightly burns and if you can't figure out what is happening here there is some pretty obvious foreshadowing about all the light stored inside of you. Well you also get a funeral scene for a person who you don't really know. People of this culture leave behind a stone infused with magic when they die, and they drop it in this big old bowl of darkness to represent going to the afterlife. Damn, that's a lot of dead people. Anyways, we should bring the darkness back to this land. There is another faction around here that worship darkness uh, differently than those that you are currently working with, and because you need to get some info from their hideout, you trick them, and you see a portrait of the old heroes of darkness on the cave walls. Then you have everything you need to do something. Ishtola talks to Udianger and says, Yeah, the Warrior of Light is being corrupted by all of that light they absorbed. You know it, I know it, and they need to know it. So now you know it. You're interrupted because basically, that evil faction has joined Yulmore and they are giving an ultimatum to the group that you are working with, putting more pressure on you to kill the Light Warden. They even poison some of the locals and are keeping the antidote to themselves. The Exarch and Valthry have a nice, warm, hostile conversation about the warrior of dankness. Exarch says smoke weed every day, and that people are defined by resilience, not falling in line, and then disappears, leaving Valthry not super happy. You finally finish up those chores to get a medallion that will make it so that the bunnies don't kill you on sight. Now with that access, we do some more chores to try and find a Light Warden in a temple. While making that journey, we are attacked again by Ranjit. This idiot steps on a trap, which causes a bottomless pit to appear. This guy also offers the antidote in an attempt to bargain, and Ranjit kicks him into the abyss. Insert a This Is Yulmore joke here. Yeet Stola yeets herself into the void and tosses the antidote at you, and Thancrit also kicks Ranjit into said bottomless pit as well, and then demonstrates his insane upper body strength. Now Ishtola and Ranjit are definitely not alive after that, so we give the antidote to the villagers. Oh hey Emmett Selk, what's that? Ishtola did the super weird teleporty thing again and we have to fish her out of the ether stream? Again? Didn't we already do this in the plot? Okay, well, I, I'll take the help though. I still don't really trust you Mr. Ashian man. Oh damn, you can bring her back with her clothes too? Fuck, and I thought we were gonna see some anime titties. This scene where Runar holds Ishtola in his big strong arms is pretty wholesome, and I think we can all agree we want to be held like that. Alright, welcome to the actual dungeon to finish this arc and kill another prime- I mean, 
Light Warden. You walk outside and Ishtola asks Udianjir to say what the stars look like. Which I mean, Ishtola sees with ether, I get that. But you're telling me that the stars don't give off perceivable ether? The writers have no idea what Ishtola can and cannot see, and it really shows. Afterwards, you look at some ancient pictures in the ruins. Emmett Selk explains that in the beginning, there was one perfect world. When things were getting out of hand in this amazingly perfect world, people summoned Zodiark to save them. People afraid of Zodiark then summoned Hydaelyn to keep him in check, but eventually, Hydaelyn prevailed. Thus, the Ashians are, in some way, part of the group that originally summoned Zodiark, and that's why they want to rejoin everything. But you are essentially told, Zodiark and Hydaelyn are just primals, like every other one that we've ever defeated. And Yulmore flees along with those other, definitely relevant tribe of people. Raktika is saved, for good now. Back at the inn for another powwow with Ardbert, he mentions that you seem no different despite all the light sealed inside of you. We ponder if Hydaelyn is really just like any old primal, and what does that make us, both warriors of light that received her blessing? Left to decide for ourselves if Emmett Selk is telling the truth or not. Although Ardbert asserts that it doesn't really matter if the blessing is good or not, often what determines if something is good or bad is perspective, and while he thinks of himself as just any old person, Making others happy always feels good. It's a pretty nice sentiment. Wake up, samurai. The city is under attack and we need to defend it. This battle is brutal as Lena's friends are turned into Sin Eaters in front of her and Thancred managed to kick ass through sheer force of will. Ardbert is also forced to sit idly by and he can't save this dude who is about to be attacked by a Sin Eater moving at the speed of Snail. Run? More like just aggressively power walk and you'll outpace that thing. Yeah, Ardbert is left to wonder why he can't intervene and be forced to watch as he can't save anybody. At the same time, the slowness of the Sin Eater movie makes this scene really hard for me to take seriously. This battle is still heartbreaking though, not just for Ardbert, but for everyone. Lena sums up the feeling of absolute hopelessness pretty well, as despite being so much closer to saving the world, she still couldn't protect some of the people closest to her, forcing herself to try to help those who remain, even though her body is broken too. It's a tragedy. Val 3 flies over, letting you know that this is his doing for betraying him, a reminder that the threat is far from gone. So the real dilemma at this point are a few things. We don't know where the other Light Wardens are. Intelligence hasn't made that possible. The Crystarium is in bad shape after the attack, and Vol 3 can absolutely command the Sin Eaters in coordinated attacks at will. Minfilia here has a suggestion to find the remaining Wardens. If she summons the power of the real Oracle, she could see them. The plot point here is that this Minifilia has the big Minfilia inside of her, but to fully awaken to her powers of the Oracle, either the host or the original Minfilia would have to be consumed by the other. Thancred doesn't like the idea since big Minfilia is the one that he loves and he doesn't want either character to die, although Minifilia is adamant about doing this, so off to Amarang where the flood was originally stalled and where you can contact big Minfilia. We travel into Amarang from a different direction to avoid Yulmore who is patrolling that part that we are more familiar with. We now have to find a way to get to where we want because it is blocked off. So there are no cutscenes for this part, but you find a village that is abandoned but not abandoned as it turns out. There is a trolley that can get you where you want to go, but it's out of commission. That's because the head of this operation, Magnus, is depressed, but maybe you can convince him to help you out. Basically, Magnus' wife was a miner. <gasps> who mined the fuel source for the Talos that moved the carts around. She mined so hard that she died. She wanted to keep the business going at the cost of her own life. Magnus now spends his days drinking the pain away. Thancred talks to him about how they both lost that which was precious to them. He mentions the time that he spent with Minfilia and how she was the beacon in his life. Also how he thinks Magnus' wife probably buried herself in her work to distract herself from the loss of her son. You managed to find the rock that the miner mined up and where she engraved that she loved her family. Magnus sees this rock and says, you could have it. You use this to fire up the talus that you need to get the cart running. Magnus sees this and while he's upset that his wife died for this, it is what she wanted. Minifilia gets upset and runs away, believing that Thancred wants her to die so that she can be Big Minfilia instead. Although Thancred overhears this, he doesn't say anything to her. When you finally get past this gate that did require a talos, 
you get interrupted by good old Ranjit again. He kicks that trolley and says he's going to kidnap Minfilia again, and she can live in peace in prison. Although she did say that she wants to stay with the people who have been with her, and that she would rather die trying to save the world than sit around in ignorance. Then Crid defends her and says that he's sorry for the emotional struggle she's going through, but he knows that she will be strong and can make her own choices. Cue the best solo instance in the game where you play as a different character. Thancred vs. Ranjit is fucking sick. Watching Thancred pull off perfect deception, slowly get more tattered as the battle rages, basically Mick dies to pull off the final hit, and Ranjit loses his transformation state and has to run away with Thancred saying, Minifilia can choose what she wants to do with her life, and no one else is awesome. I've done the MSQ a few times, but I do love this sequence every single time. If the solo instances in Endwalker are half as good as this, I think the player base will be happy. Thancred collapses to the ground after combat and basically says he understands that Minfilia threw her life away to try and save the remainder of the first, and he knows that's what she wanted to do. Here's what saving the first somewhat from the flood looks like, by the way. And Ardbird is left behind because he still has something to do. If only we knew what it was. So cut to Minfilia. Alright, if you gain the power of the Oracle, you'll be able to hunt down the remaining Light Wardens. But what do you want, Minifilia? One of us will have to perish for that to happen. Minifilia says that she wants to fight and save the first, so Minfilia agrees and gives her the power of the Oracle to continue the fight. Minfilia doesn't mind that she'll be gone, because saving the first is more important. So Minifilia now looks different. She's afraid to tell Thancred that Minfilia is dead, but he takes it in stride, able to understand and accept Minifilia for who she is and the choices that she's made. He's given her the name of Reen, and I finally don't have to keep saying Minfilia for the rest of this video. It's a good scene. So Reen, where's the next Light Warden? It's in a mineshaft? Alright, let's do it. Easy peasy, the darkness has arrived. Holding this light in is getting real painful. Probably can't handle it anymore. Reen also thinks it's not looking good. Artbird is telling you that existence is suffering. Oh, there's that pain again. Wow, something crazy is happening when Artbird touches you. Show us where he touched you on the doll. I guess there is something that he has to do that will probably help with all that light. Not like we know what that is. But all heroes need a team. The Exarch inquires if you're okay. Well, at least the pain went away. You go to sleep and have a vision of a person reading the Heavensward expansion, which is now included in the new expanded free trial of Final Fantasy XIV that goes up to level 60 for free with no restrictions on playtime. Who is reading that? Actually, you know, now I think about it, that didn't really look like from any timeline that I'm aware of. Yeah, it's probably a vision of Ardbird. It's not like there's anybody else who is nearby before he went to sleep. There is only one Light Warden left. It's time to plan. Let's get hyped up. Emmett Selk tells you that you all suck and it was fun to watch you despite how shitty you are. He elaborates on the tales of Zodiac and Heidelin yet again. Zodiac was made first to preserve the star, and Heidelin second. Heidelin did defeat Zodiac, but it's thanks to her ability to essentially reduce things down and dilute them. So she split Zodiac into 14 parts, but as a consequence also split the entire universe into 14 parts as well. The whole world was reduced to 1 14th of the greatness of the people of the past, where it was awesome and everybody was immortal. So that's why the Ashians want to restore the world. Oops, the 13th shard kind of got fucked up. And what's that? You're only like 4 7th as cool with all the shards that have been infused into the source. So have fun. Yulmore is preparing a solid defense and we have to strike fast. They might have a light warden in the city given how fortified they made it. Off we go. Man, the people are acting kind of weird in Kalugia when you get there, attacking people on sight and talking about how cool Valtteri is. So you try to figure out what has happened and why. Kaishir, your now intelligence agent in Yulmore, isn't affected along with all the newcomers. We do know that Valtteri has a mind control ability, but his ability to control people doesn't seem determined by magic resistance, which is why Thancred isn't affected. And since the newer people seem more resilient, hmm, yeah I know exactly where this is going. Yep, Mjol is made a Sin Eater, and by eating it over years and years, it slowly converts people and allows them to be controlled by Valtteri, in the same way that he controls Sin Eaters already. So most citizens of Yulmore are brainwashed, but Alphano also figures that people eventually just turn into straight up Sin Eaters, which is how Valtteri has so many in his ranks. And yes, that offhanded comment about Ascension is probably turning people into Sin Eaters. Thus the promise of Yulmore is even more of a lie than I originally thought, because you might live, but probably not as a human. 
Although I'm getting some mixed messaging here. Kai Shear was starving because he couldn't eat any mule, and as a result, he was also not able to be brainwashed. So, starvation is good? Anyways, we need to confront Valtteri because Reen says there is a light warden up there. Remember, no Yulmore. I mean, you actually straight up murder a lot of civilians. Granted, their minds are pretty much gone, but I mean, they still look like people and not Sin Eaters. So you defeat those creepy clown ladies and have your confrontation with Ranjit. You wonder why he fights so strongly for Valtteri despite clearly not being brainwashed, but he really does believe that continuing the fight would only be suffering for everybody. The fight isn't as fun as playing as Thancred, but you defeat him and find Valtteri. Yeah, he's just eating a bunch of Sin Eaters. And an entire fork. Eh, that's kinda creepy. And he grows really tiny wings and flies away. To a giant floating island that he made and it's hard to get to. Time to try to help the citizens of Yulmore that we didn't completely slaughter. Well, hopefully we can just put those brainwashed people fully to sleep and figure out a way to deal with that later. Rain thinks she might be able to do something. So we tell the citizens that they have been brainwashed, but they were still a piece of shit to most low-class citizens of their own free will. Well, they kind of feel bad and they want to try to help you for saving them. So, how do we get to Mount Glug? First, we need to get up a cliff. Thankfully, Chai Nuz is an expert on Talos, which is what we use to power the cliff elevator. Now we have to actually get to the mountain. Flying is probably out of the question because we are too vulnerable in the air. We need a way to walk there. Also, there are some dwarves up here that say Lali Ho, but don't be deceived. The dwarves are just Lalafell with outfits that give them beards, and that's canon. The Exarch is also here to try to help and solve a floating mountain problem. Alright, the plan is to make a giant Talos to reach out and carry us up to the floating stronghold. China first says that's impossible, but then he says, well if all it has to do is reach out and nothing else, maybe it could be done. Then he says we don't have enough people, so Alize says, how many people do you need? We got people in Yulmore and in the Crystarium. You need to mine rocks, Amaring has you covered. You need magic, the darkness worshippers can also do that. I think we should call the Pixies. Udianger says that we can't have the Pixies help. Shut the fuck up, Udianger. Okay, wow, I guess we're not going to ask the fairies for help. But yeah, afterwards, Chinos looks at you after listing all those people and says, Hang on, isn't that literally everyone left on the planet? How did you manage to recruit all these people? And we say, we're the real deal, baby. Better go apologize to those locals nearby that you tormented, though, because we need them. Chinas is discouraged, but you remind him that we do all this crazy stuff to protect the people that we care about, and he becomes invigorated and ready to rumble. So you do some more chores to set up the Talos, but the Exarch is clearly exhausted from all the fighting you've been doing. When you talk to him, he talks about how he became one with the Tower to try and live forever, because that's how much time he would need to try and save the First, and ultimately save a single individual, who is the hero that he always looked up to. He asks what you will do when this is over, but you turn that question back on him and he says, he doesn't know what he'll do in the end, but he wishes he could adventure with the hero that he idolizes. That would be the greatest gift that he could ever ask for. It's time to talk about a side story that pops up in a couple of cutscenes about what's going on in the source. Astinian and Gaius are going around Garlemal trying to stop the Black Rose gas attack and gain information. Gaius and Astinian walk around in plain sight in the capital city of Garlemal and talk about there still being a stalemate on the battlefield. Also, Gaius implies that there is another person possessing people's bodies, and that's when we see that the real Xenos is in the capital wanting to get his old body back. Elidibus reveals that he knows that the Scions are currently in the first and that they could use this opportunity to slay them while their bodies are still vulnerable. But he's interrupted by Xenos getting his body back, and everything fades to black. Okay, back in the first, it's time to fire up that Talos made of all the hard work of civilization. Man, I can't believe that worked, but there's still quite a few Sin Eaters that would need to be taken care of. Thankfully, Fail Ul shows up and blasts a bunch away. Hey, wait a minute. I thought they would never show up. Look, even Feiwu said that you should have asked them for help because they said they would. This makes me upset. Alright, we scare the mountain and it's time for the real fight. Oh no, he's hot. Well, that was easy. Time to absorb some more light again. What is this vision that we are seeing? Oh, is that Valtry being born? An Ashian made Valtry. Emmett Salk's gonna have some explaining to do. That's gonna have to wait though because I don't think all this light can be contained. The Exarch here says that the light is too much for you to bear, so he will relieve you of the burden. This almost seems evil for a second until Udi Anger stops Ishtola from stopping the Crystal Exarch, who's taking all the excess light from you and is planning to teleport into the void and take it with him. That's it. That's the Crystal Exarch's grand plan. 
In all the commotion, his hood flies off to reveal a certain character. It's Grahatia. And now this is when this video gets weird because I've never talked about Grahatia other than saying he's from the Crystal Tower raid story arc from A Realm Reborn. And I'm just going to leave it at that. If you did that by this point in the story, you can call him by name and he wishes you a farewell as he calls you the hero that he wanted to save. Yes, he was talking about you when mentioning the people he didn't want to lose. He's interrupted by MX Selk who shoots him to stop this light transfer teleport. I gotta say, Mr. Selk, making an entire empire just to invent guns so you could shoot Grahatia is pretty elaborate. Basically, he doesn't want Grahatia's plan to work. He was willing to consider you equals if the Warrior of Light could contain all the light, but clearly, it was too much to handle. Although, he thought it was weird that the Crystal Exarch had the Crystal Tower and was able to do the things he did, but it makes sense because Grahatia was from the Source. And so, he says you'll soon turn into a monster, but you can seek him out in the Tempest if you want to end your days there. Oh, even if you managed to control all the light, he would have killed you anyways. Emmet Selk also takes Grahatia away, and you pass out. You wake up in the inn and everything is light again. Yep, all of your hard work has been undone. Arbert is glad to see that you're awake, but it's very clear how much the light corruption is spreading through your body. Walking out of your room to see the world doesn't help much. You are, in fact, the one showering the world with light right now. Arbert comes out and says, Yeah, things are not looking too great. However, it's still not over yet. Even though it doesn't seem possible now, he too once thought that this world was done for when he made the choice to go to the Source in a last-ditch effort to save it. As he wandered the light-scorched world as a spirit, he wondered if it was all worth it. But seeing you and what you were able to do so far, making the Talos and bringing people together, I'm sure that you'll find a way. His story might be almost over completely, but he still has a role to play in your tale. Heroes often forget that they don't have to do everything alone. Phil Ull shows up and says, why so down? You need to believe in yourself like Grahatia believed in you. So we're going to go to the Crystal Tower and figure out what to try and do next to fix this. In the tower, you see a vision of Grahatia and Udianger, presumably soon after Udianger arrived in the first. In this vision, Grahatia talks about how he is from the far future in the Source, where the Warrior of Light died. Although Sid and other members pooled their efforts to try and find a way to travel through time and space to stop the Warrior of Light from dying in the first place. Part of the plan required using the Crystal Tower and awakening Grahatia, who then carried out the rest of the plan over an undetermined amount of time until they finally cracked the code and arrived in the first. He knew he would need the Warrior of Light to be able to defeat the Sin Eaters and worked on bringing them here. His plan is to then take the corrupted Aether that the Warrior of Light absorbs and die with it. This is his grand plan, and Udianger will be his accomplice. Yes, Udianger did not actually have a vision of this happening, but was told about the future by Grahatia. In the end, he wants to do all of this because the Warrior of Light is the inspiration to all in the times of disaster. The one who could be at wit's end and keep going. The one who never doubted themselves and stayed the course no matter the loss. The irony here being, of course, Grahatia, in traveling through time and space, and working on this for what is effectively forever, he has done exactly the kind of ludicrous feat that he describes the Warrior of Light doing. Grahatia, despite claiming he isn't as great as the Scions will ever be, has in many ways far surpassed what they are ever going to be capable of. Grahatia is the hero that he describes, and hearing this tale and seeing this vision, the Warrior of Light has found a new resolve to find Grahatia and Emmet Selk and finish the job. Reen is able to stabilize your body for the time being, but she has no idea how long it will last for. The pain of your party members is pretty obvious as they know there is nothing they can do to help you. But they're all in agreement. Sitting around is a waste of time and trying to stop Emmet Selk seems like a good course of action. Everyone in the Crystarium is also ready to help. It's time to make towards the Tempest, which is at the bottom of the ocean. To get to the bottom of the ocean, you find Bismarck. Don't worry about there being a Bismarck here. Bismarck will not take you to the bottom of the sea, but I know a fairy that can help. Fail O, help us please. <laughs> You finally learned how to ask me for help. So Bismarck goes to the bottom of the ocean now and makes a giant air bubble for us. For the Tempest, I can turbo through all this. You find fish people who don't trust you. To gain their trust, you must investigate the underwater buildings which they claim belong to the ancients. These buildings are made out of impossible materials that not any civilization that anyone is aware of could possibly make. But if you fix a lantern for the fish people, they will believe you and worthy of their trust. So you visit a crazy artisan at the bottom of the ocean as well, struggling with self-doubt, and you tell him a tale of heroism 
that varies depending on which series of roll quests you did. He then regains his confidence and gives you class gear for your job and gives you the fixed lantern that you need. The fish people then lead you to an entire city similar to the buildings that you just investigated that popped up recently and were probably made by Emmett Selk. Whew, okay, welcome to the city. So you run around and find out where Emmett Selk is, although you figure he's in a big fancy building, so you go through some bureaucrats to get there. While waiting on this bench, a figure waits with you. So this city is made by Emmett Selk to recreate the source when it was not split. We have heard the Zodiar creation tale multiple times now, but Emmett Selk failed to mention that half the world was sacrificed to stop the destruction, and another half of what remained was sacrificed to bring life back. That's when people wanted to stop sacrificing to Zodiark, and instead leave the world in the hands of the new life that appeared, and ultimately, why Hydaelyn was created. Emmett Selk wants to exact the will of Zodiark, a task that he alone believes to carry out. But really, there is no clear answer for what is right. Although your soul, the warrior of Light's soul, carries a specific color, and you certainly are the soul of a certain special person that Emmett Selk once knew when you were whole. Ardbert and you are also pieces of that same soul. Well, it's our turn now. Hopefully we find Emmett Selk. There he is. This confrontation pretty much goes like this. Yes, after the source was fully fused with all the shards, they would then sacrifice all life to bring back their ancient loved ones. Emmett Selk has judged all empires over all ages and has evaluated that you will never be as pure as the originals. Alphano says that everything is in the past and bringing them back at the cost of those in the present is madness, but Emmett Selk doesn't care. And so you decide a final showdown will prove that you are worthy to inherit the star you occupy. Amarant is a dungeon that's pretty long. Another chat happens and all your friends get inflicted with down for the count again, and it appears that light finally consumes you. Then Ardbert appears and says, if you had the strength, could you save the world? Of course I can. So you fuse together, contain the light, and Emic Selk sees a vision of your soul and realizes for a moment who you were when you were whole. Grahatia gets up to the surprise of everyone and summons additional warriors to help you. This ends now. You get to battle Emmett Selk as Hades. Welp, after you weaken him, Thancred pops in and uses that weapon that Udi Anger prepared earlier, and you kill another Ashian, just like the good old days. With all your friends helping you build up a giant cum shot and using the axe that Arbert gave you. Emmett Selk, with a hole in him, in his last moments, says, Not to forget that the Ashians once lived. You can interpret this in many ways, but a large part of Emmett Selk is constantly saying that people who are alive today will never surpass those of old. The way I look at it, he already knew that people had accomplished more than he let on. Grahatia solving dimensional time travel, you holding in the light, Grahatia still standing despite everything, and even though he didn't see it, Zenos figuring out immortality off screen. All of this proves you were already able to be more than the ancients. Emic Selk really uses this veil as an excuse because he really just wanted to revive his loved ones. But now that it's all over, it's good to see Grahatia awake. And your soul is fixed by using up all that light to slay Emmett Selk. Everything is good in the hood. So you go back to the Crystarium and everyone cheers. Roll credits. The Shadowbringers epilogue is as follows. We can't bring the Scions back yet, and they're still trying to work that one out. Everyone says, okay, we still want to say goodbye. The Sin Eaters have all retreated, and darkness is restored, so it'll work out probably. The Warrior of Light returns to the source, and we see that Grahatia still can't return at all. So there are some things that we're going to have to take care of. Of course, there's another cut-in for the Empire. Xenos got his body back, Elidibus has fled, and Xenos kills Varus because it would stop his hunt if Varus was still in charge. Astinian and Gaius witnessed this event because they were spying in the royal palace, and Gaius attempts to stop Xenos before everything fades to black. Elidibus talks to himself on the moon, realizing that he is the last of the red-masked Ashtians, who are the strongest, and that's the end of Shadowbringers the Core. But you know what time it is. You thought this video was over? I'm already in too deep. Welcome to all of the patches. So you're back in the source, and little time has passed here. Tataru is happy to see you again, but Kryle is unhappy. To inform you that the Scions are dying and that you need to bring their souls back from the first or they're going to die. Since you can carry possessions on you, all you gotta do is carry their souls back in those crystal things that you normally use to kill Ashians. So you go back to the first and seek out a recluse who knows all about manipulating souls, and they test you with a bunch of nonsense. When you pass, and probably have a party member die to mortal flame, Beck Lug agrees to listen to your pleas, 
and help now that they know you're the hero who brought back the darkness. You can move souls back if they are dormant, but that's a little risky, and also similar to the people who are dying at Camp Sadness. So Beck Luck decides to see if they can do anything to help those people. Good thing they already have a potion made. And it kind of works? It doesn't fix the soul, but you probably can fix a soul with a familiar to channel even more magic healing sauce. So do some chores to make a familiar. Alize, make that clay look like a porksy. Eh, close enough. So Alize uses that familiar and heals Harlick, I, I guess. We're still not getting a full sentence out of him, though. Although this technique has promise of working for the tempered back in the source like Gabu. There's trouble in Yulmor. Dulia Chai, what's going on? Chai Nuz has ran away because the city wanted him to be the leader. That's what Julia Chai thinks. Instead, Chai Nuz is actually leaving town temporarily to find Rendin, who used to help Yulmor before Valtry took over. And he wants to try to solve some of the problems that they face. Rendin questions if Chai Nuz is worthy of leadership, and Chai Nuz says that Yulmor is going to have to take matters into their own hands. So Rendin gives a test. Solve Yulmor's food crisis. Simple. We just revive the Kalusian agriculture with Talos. Better go tame some wild Talos. Bam. Rendon thinks China's is cool, and China's goes and fucks his wife, and then everyone claps. Also, in the Imperial Palace, after Astinian and Gaius witness the Emperor being murdered, they are apparently accused of being responsible for Varys' death. Then Astinian fucks some shit up and they leave the place. And in Yulmore, everyone is happy to start working on rebuilding, and an Arbert lookalike shows up and says some very Ashian-like things. 5.2 kicks off with nothing interesting. Gaius tells you that the Empire is making another ultimate weapon. Yeah, and next thing you're gonna tell me that we have to fight Xenos again. Don't fucking tell me. Alright, I'm going back to the first and we're not going to talk about the Empire ruining this good plot. Alright, they want us to boost the morale of some soldiers by doing a battle against some Sin Eaters. And someone else who looks like Arbert claims to be the Warrior of Light has already killed all the Sin Eaters. Well, that was a really good use of time. We gather everyone up to talk about how the Warriors of Light were not the villains in the past, but simply misunderstood. So yeah, everyone feels kind of bad for not revering the Warriors of Light because they really were heroes. Thankfully, Ardbert appears and tells everyone that he is that hero and everyone needs to learn to fight for themselves. Everybody can be a warrior of light. Even you, person who mashes buttons fervently on their keyboard. Yeah, that Ardbert is not the real one. He is an Ashian, most likely a Litibus. We're gonna have to be careful with that guy. Ishtola says, let's go to the Raktika Great Woods. I ask why. She responds with, let's go to the Raktika Great Woods, but more sternly this time. Tell us where there are some awesome ronkin' weapons that we can use. Yeah, there's just a spooky statue here. Although Ishtola has a revelation that perhaps the souls of the past still remember the great tragedies of the final days, and that the Echo is something that once belonged to those powerful souls of the past as well. Which is cool and all. Let's get out of here to Slitherboro so that Runar can eavesdrop that Ishtola is leaving. Also, Ardbert is here for some reason. Yeah, yeah, Ardbert. What do you think about Seto? You wish he wasn't dead? You're not going to be fooling anybody then. Okay, Elidibus. We're going to go deeper into the Tempest to learn about Ashians. See you later. We go back to the Ondo Cups. Oh, there's bad fish people nearby? They're planning on killing everybody on land? Well, not anymore, there aren't. Bismarck can help us destroy that evil homeland. Udi Andrew has become Jesus instead of learning how to swim, and the Scions are not holding up super well. So let's take a break and save someone who is already saved because they were inspired to do good deeds. Is it okay to do the right thing for the wrong reasons? Anyways, we actually do this dungeon. So that invasion was prevented, but this building is actually important and built by the Ancients. So we see a holographic scene where the Ancients talk about making Hydaelyn. This chick, Vanat, says that she will become the heart of Hydaelyn, and although they won't die, they can choose their form from here on out, and they wonder if this is how people felt about Elidibus. In other words, Elidibus is the heart of Zodiac. Except Elidibus is a title, and technically the one we know could not be the one that we just heard about, but that wouldn't actually make sense. Back at the Crystarium, people want to quit their jobs to become heroes. Don't worry about this giant meteor swarm that's being casted. That's just another day of the week. Now everybody's a warrior of flight. Hell yeah, brother. So Elidibus explains that what he did literally awakened everyone to Hydaelyn's call. And while you think that should be a bad thing for him, he says that it's all good because he too is a warrior of light. Yeah, something stupid's about to happen. I like it. I also like at the end of 5.2 when they all say they have no idea what's going on. 
but at least the person visits you at night depending on what role quest you did, or you get to choose who visits you if you did multiple. Xenos is also having dreams about the final days, and there's yet another Ashian. Welp, anyways, in the first you start to wonder, who actually are the Warriors of Light? Is there anything that we can learn here? There are legends of heroes in the past in the first who have used that name, and supposedly hear the call of Hydaelyn. In fact, this sounds very much like the Warriors of Light in the Source. So it turns out there have been many Warriors of Light probably in every dimension over many years. Although, is serving Light inherently good? No one knows. So this adorable little cat girl wants to be a hero. She wants to be an apothecary specifically. Well guess what, idiot? It's not in the game, and they're never adding Apothecary to Final Fantasy XIV. Guess we can help you pursue this worthless endeavor though, and show how strong we are to some other kids. They're definitely not going to grow up okay. Hello Elidibus, I see that you're actually the original Elidibus. Thanks for letting me know that we are going to die by your hand. Anyways, Grahatia is here to talk, and Elidibus just kind of blasts him on the way out, although it doesn't really hurt Grahatia. Yeah, he's definitely overexerting himself trying to get the Soul Jar return thing up and running. And back in the source, we are here to see if maybe we can find a way to make this Soul Transfer thing actually work. Tataru makes some bread and it tastes like shit, which is exactly what Charlie and bread is supposed to taste like according to Cryo. Perfect, let's give this to Grahatia. And basically, the Soul Crystal Memory Transfer thing are made only thanks to Grahatia pouring his life essence into it. Grahatia can also come back to the source with this method, but it's unknown if his past self would blend with his current self. And we go to find Ishtola in a nighter, where she's been hanging out. Oh shit, she's collapsed. Hello again, Elidibus. Is it memory viewing time? I see. You were good at your job, and obsessed with the Warrior of Light. Okay, time to go on a tour of the plot up until this point, so I can skip all of that. Except you do get to kill images of your friend, and thank god we got another Zeno solo instance! Anyways, defeating Elidibus proves not that hard, and Ishtola is alive. But yeah, here's the reveal. Elidibus is actually part of Zodiark, who is in fact a primal by all accounts. And since Zodiark was made with the desire to save the world, that's also what drives Elidibus. He is the one who made the heroes, and even at time, was them. Although he probably doesn't have a will of his own anymore. Elidibus leaves and a weird stone is left behind. Ooh, there's some more stones, and they all have interesting stuff to say. Each crystal is an account of a life of a member of the Convocation, as remembered by a Red Ashian. The Convocation being the ones who usually summon Zodiark. Thanks, bench waiting person. He also mentions that Elidibus might seem crazy in his single-minded ambition, but he does have a good reason. Elidibus just doesn't remember what that is anymore. And while the 13 core members of the Convocation stayed in the city, the 14th went around to learn about the world and often called upon her personal friends for help. That's what that specific stone represents. So back in Yulemore, meteors start falling from the sky again. Amarant is now above the ocean and people are remembering the final days while other warriors are being summoned to attack you. We have to defend the first from one final attack. So fend off some spectral enemies and have a tour of Norvrent on the way out. I like this dungeon a lot thematically, a very cool battle while you get to see a lot of the characters from Shadowbringers. And the crew blasts some enemies away, enough for you to get through while Thancred mentions how cool he is. Insert Red Mage Limit Break 3 flashbang joke here. Before this happened, for a little bit of dramatic irony, Grahatia did manage to get his vessel complete, but not for the Warrior of Light to see. Elidibus needs to explain that he only needs to summon heroes, desire to slave evil, and that's how this spell works. Very important. What is actually important though is that Grahatia is in trouble, which is why we need to try to get to the Crystal Tower quickly. Oh, they did manage to escape, except Elidibus took the Exarch's USB memory stick, although it is what let Elidibus use the Crystal Tower to summon all the Spectral Warriors. So the Exarch is very clearly dying and turning into Crystal, and Lina sees this. Grahatia mentions that no matter what happens, he always cherished the time that he and Lina spent together. Lina says, don't act like this is the end, you're not going to die but immediately breaks down when Grahatia leaves, knowing that he's not coming back. While running to stop a little bit, Grahatia makes another remark about how he's no hero, but the Warrior of Light does ask a question. Why do you do all this for me specifically? Elidibus also seems to have irrationally dedicated himself to a cause. Grahatia says that while it might seem stupid, he and many others wish to stop the calamity. While that's more of an excuse, he just wanted to go back to the days when he got to adventure with the people he looked up to. So he holds the line while you finally get to confront Elidibus at his peak. Well, he says he will strike you down because he promised, but he can't recall who he made that promise to. There might not be anything left to fight for when it comes to the Ashians, but it's all going to end here. 
Good thing we kept that crystal, or we might have died. Although we lose until we're saved by a certain specific ephemeral being whose mannerisms seem pretty familiar. Good luck with that mandatory tank limit break 3. After beating the Warrior of Light, Grahatia lands the finishing blow using what remaining power the Crystal Tower provides. Elidibus, as he dies, remembers that he left Zodiac to help his friends, and Grahatia dies turning into Crystal with his last wish to go on an adventure with you. Although we do have his soul and memories in that vial, there is no guarantee that it works. He says that we will meet again. While his memories and soul will join you, his everlasting crystallized body will remain at the top of the tower to remind everyone that hope will remain. Alright, it's time for some tear jerkers. While you did tell Elidibus what he forgot, you still had to kill him in the end. No one knows if that was the right thing to do. Yes, Emmett Selk is the one who gave you the strength to defeat Elidibus. Becklug tells you that, of course Grahatia wants to return to the source. Before he left, he said that everyone always has some shred of hope. And while he too might have forgotten exactly what drove him forward, you often don't need the specifics to keep going. So he will come back to the source no matter the risk because it's wrong to throw away the second chance he was given. Welcome to a tour of goodbyes before returning to the source. At the inn at Journey's Head, they will continue to treat the victims in Alize's absence. While they are sad to see her go, she helped them find this treatment method that they thought was impossible. Harlick shows how much he's recovered by reciting Tesleen's words, The time left to you is precious. In Yulmore, Alphino bids farewell, which gets Dulia Chai worked up about as much as you would expect. Alphino reflects on his past and his own mistakes when he too thought he could rule over others, and shows his gratitude to Yulmore that despite making a similar mistake, they were quick to embrace change and become better. Dulia Chai wishes Alphino a heartfelt goodbye, and so you go to Ilmeg where you're going to return that soul crystal that became of Ardbert's body when you slew Elidibus. While giving this to Seto, the best person to take it, Warrior of Light channels Ardbert to say goodbye. And I'll be damned, I think almost everyone cried listening to Seto and Ardbert talk. Seto saying that he wished he could have told Ardbert how much he cared, and Ardbert saying that he always knew. Ardbert's soul now lives on in you, and since Ardbert's journey isn't over, neither is Seto's. It's a good scene. In Raktika, Runar tells Ishtola not to leave, but he's just kidding. Ishtola mentioned that there is technically a way to go between worlds, so she might return one day. You never know. You say goodbye to Magnus. Thancred says that leaving behind Reen is fine because she learned how to fend for herself from the best. Okay, finally time to give a proper goodbye to Reen. She says thanks for everything and really for giving her life. Go give her a good head pat, Thancred, and tell her that you're proud of her. Alright, goodbye to everyone else too. Lena also says goodbye and to tell the Exarch as she knows him when he reawakens in the first to live his life to the fullest and remember the good times that they all had together. Alright, everyone puts their souls in the crystals, which looks very nice next to my thousands of magic prisms, and we return to the source and put everyone's souls back in their bodies. Yep, it all worked out in the end. Now, nah, we're gonna have to go get someone special who isn't directly in this room. It's time to bring back Rahatia. With that, everyone who isn't the twins get their new outfits and everything's good, ready to take on whatever comes next. It's also good to see Grahatia fully back. Something something, evil Xenos and Ashians who are using Asahi's body. And that's the true end of Shadowbringers. I normally end this episode here, but I will summarize the next two patches in a super turbo fashion because Endwalker is going to be incredibly long apparently. Also, there is a lot that I don't care about in these patches that I'm going to skip. Limsa is in trouble. Gabu is tempered, but we now know how to cure him. We're gonna have to make another familiar though. The Empire is in chaos, so we don't have to worry about that for the time being. Let's go talk to Sid just because I want to talk to him. Okay, we actually need to use some Magitech to make a better method for curing tempering because it's not exactly the same as curing light corruption. We should also probably get Matoya's help for making additional familiars. It's so complicated it requires an entire dungeon to make said familiars. With this cure in place, we can finally put an end to this primal production problem. Except there is a problem with the pirates not being piratey enough, and stealing crystals from Beast Tribe to make tensions extra high. Merla Webb kicks their ass though and shows them who the biggest pirate is. Now we go to the Kobolds and cure their tempering and kind of fix relations, but not fully. At least Titan will probably not be summoned anymore. We go to Alamigo where a good old fashioned flandangly ball sack summons Lunar Bahamut, proclaiming that he wants to kill everyone and himself, and we lose the fight in a cutscene because Lunar Bahamut is just so strong. There's also some towers all over the place. You have a nice conversation at this table, Arnvald and Fordolag are going to investigate the towers, because the towers temper people nearby into serving the Empire, so you need an echo to not be tempered. 
Well, to deal with Lunar Bahamut, we need the help of the dragons. So we call up Astinian. He mistakes Alize for Alphano, which is mandatory to do. Remember that dragon Tiamat that we left in jail? It's finally time to break them out. I mean, they were tempered, although they hadn't lost control, so we cure that before going to stop Lunar Bahamut. It takes four people to kill Lunar Bahamut, and not the eight required to beat the two Ashians that we defeated like five hours ago. I kind of hate how much this fight was hyped up. Arnvald got obliterated while exploring the tower, and Fordola gets mad at Alphano for being sad. We then go to another meeting that doesn't matter. Alphano watches the birth of a grand company of Eorzea, which he always dreamed of. It's a nice little moment. Uh-oh, there's a message from Charlian. It's the twin's father, who we don't know much about other than the twins are very nervous to see him. He says Charlian will not help stop the Empire from destroying the world, and then promptly disowns his children. Well, that was kind of weird. With that plot point on hold, we have another battle with Lunar Ifrit this time and hold off the threat of the towers while failing to be able to save everyone. Despite the losses, the Scions say that we will fight until the very end as we look to the moon with a please purchase Endwalker today message appearing and the theme song starts playing. Xenos is also a Reaper now in the end and we learn that the towers are draining the Aether from everything around them and hopefully the world doesn't die. And that's the setup for the next expansion completely butchered purely out of spite by myself. Now after all of that, let me at least share my thoughts about Shadowbringers, the full story. It's probably pretty obvious, but I really do like the plot of Shadowbringers. There are many memorable moments throughout the entire journey. The themes are pretty obvious, even just the setting of a world at the brink of apocalypse is very different in tone from the whole journey up until this point. We see the Warrior of Light actually struggle and suffer quite a bit, and the character cast feels strong and very well developed. Some highlights for me though, all the talks with Ardberg about the struggles and satisfaction of being a hero, and even though he brought the Flood, that doesn't mean that he can't redeem himself. Watching Lena break down multiple times throughout and showing the effects of some survivor guilt that she can't help everyone is honestly pretty heartbreaking, and it feels like it landed much better than it did when they tried to do something similar in previous parts of the plot. It is genuinely hard to watch when she collapses and is frustrated by her own limits. Going off of that, obviously there's a big theme about loss and how people cope with it. Thancred lost Minfilia and struggles to let her go. Ranjit wants to stop fighting because it would be less painful than to see another Minfilia die before his eyes. Magnus struggles to find the motivation to keep going. Grahatia becomes a completely new person trying to stop the loss of the Warrior of Light. And even Emmett, Selk, and Elidibus have motivations rooted in the loss of those they cared about before the world split into parts. It shows you that the villains, while still villains, have their own motivations rooted in something believable. It doesn't justify their actions other than to themselves, making them feel much more rounded out and whole compared to what we might have gotten in the past. In a more specific note, Emmett Selk and his screen time are entertaining while still showing you that he can't be totally trusted. A large part of his character is talking down on how much worse people are now, but you can see that he has doubts when he realizes Grahatia solved the time-space travel, which is why he's so preoccupied with asking him about it all the time. And as I already mentioned, when he's ultimately defeated, he can't deny how far people have come and that he just wanted people to remember that they once lived. I also even like the small character arc that Thancred gets, where you can see him lose confidence in himself to be able to succeed, but after winning against Ranjit, he gets his confidence back again and remembers that he's still strong even though he lost his magic abilities. In many ways, this story feels like the culmination of the plot. Not in the sense of the story that it tells, but in the sense that it is built off the scenes that worked well in the past and addressing some of the old shortcomings. It's easy to see where this could have been like Stormblood had they tried to split the story into the first and the source at the same time. But they leave the source to a small side thing while focusing much more on the events of the first and not accidentally leaving it shallow. Even keeping the trials actually tied more directly to the story rather than just being some random side event makes the battles feel much more significant. And finally, you get Grahatia. While I don't like him as much as some of the other characters, he is still great in the way that he's written. His character flaw is pretty obvious, it's a bad case of self-doubt and imposter syndrome, because despite everything he does from living for a long time, solving space-time travel, preventing an umbral calamity, and even landing the final blow to defeat Elidibus for good, he still somehow thinks he's not as cool as the Scions. He's quite literally the hero of the first, and even the people of the Crystarium say as much. And to top it all off, 5.3 is probably one of the best story patch, finishing up everything and giving a victory lap that feels very emotional. A proper send-off to a complete arc where there really aren't too many loose ends. As the plot moves forward towards Endwalker, I can say that the expectations are incredibly high coming off the back of Shadowbringers. 
I do genuinely think it's one of the better stories told in a JRPG. As I play the game more and more and sometimes become more jaded at how gameplay changes and other content feels neglected, replaying Shadowbringer's story makes me remember why so many people love this story and by extension, this game. Now let's get out there and tell me never to make a video this long ever again.